Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host of the chats that I produce with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The Fireside Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm speaking with Greta von Breitenbach in Switzerland, who is gracious enough to meet with us today. So, Greta, in what city are you located? Um, I am located near Basel, a little bit in the countryside. Uh, actually, the, the village I live in is Breitenbach. So my name, von Breitenbach, is just a local thing. Lovely. Let's begin at the beginning. Please tell us about your early life, a little bit about your family, where you're from. Um, originally, I was born in Germany in a small town, and um, it was like, um, yeah, I, I felt like the only gay in town because it was a very small town. And um, my parents were very welcoming about it. They, they knew before I spoke out and uh, they always supported me. And, oh, if, if you bring someone home, it's okay. And uh, they didn't uh, use the term of girlfriend or boyfriend. They just always said, if you bring someone home. Oh. It, at this time, my life at school wasn't so nice because uh, there it, it wasn't uh, so, 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 so popular to be gay. And it, it, typical bullying and, and all this happened to me a, a lot. And um, this time is a, 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 a bit special for me because my parents always encouraged me. They said, everything's fine, but my other environment wasn't so welcoming. Do you, did you begin to learn about the fetish scene at that time, the leather scene? How did I, you learn was, about these? <laughs> I, I was attracted by, by biker gays since I can think. So since I was a very small boy, I always looked at those motorbikes and motorcycles and, and thought, oh my God, they are so, so interesting. But it wasn't the machine itself, it was the rider on it. And later, I found out I have got a leather and rubber fetish. And so I started to connect with a local fetish scene, but it was very small because, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> it was in the, in the early nineties. And, and uh, here we had, haven't had so many possibilities to go out. You are the only active sister of perpetual indulgence in Switzerland, correct? Yes, that's right. Lovely. I would love to speak with about that. So I think many people will be interested to hear how you combine being a sister with participation in the fetish scene and the leather scene. How do you see that? Fetish is uh, an, an interest of me too. And so I... Uh made some connections with some nice guys. And in 2017, when I already moved to Switzerland, I had the chance to be the sesh wife of Mr. Rubber Switzerland in 2017. And later he was elected Mr. Rubber Europe 2018. Oh. And in this time, I had the chance to, to get a little bit closer to see what the sisters actually do. Because until this point, I always thought, oh, they're, they're wonderful, but I, I don't know what they do, how they do it, and, and why they do, they do it. And in 2017, we were collecting donations together with the sisters, and there I had the chance to, to get a little bit more about what's driving them on, what's going about it, and, and this is where my sister journey started. How did you get your sister's name? My sister's name... It's a, a, a little bit history. Um, Greta is taken from the, the movie Bent. And this movie is about gay love in Berlin of the 30s, 1930s, before the Nazis were coming up. Yes. And Greta was ruling a nightclub and she was giving um, the gays and, and the lesbians and all people coming together their space to, to, to have fun, to be their selves. She was... Uh, in the movie played by Mick Jagger and, and a very wonderful Greta. And uh, Greta was the person who saved some lives because she warned them because of the Nazis. And she said, oh, be careful, they're coming. And this is 
because I would not not uh, because of the racism thing I choose this, but because Greta was there to give an open eye, an open ear, and uh, an open space to to gaze, and this is what I would like to do. And von Breitenbach, as I told, I live in Breitenbach in, near Basel, and this is just uh, the the local local um, put together, like Liesel von der Post or something like this. Please tell me about the appearance of the sisters, the white face. What is the significance of this? Originally, the white face symbolizes the death of HIV and uh, the colors we have in our face is uh, the, the joy of living we try to set against this. Because when, when the sisters founded their sets in 1979, um, it, the first thing was to go out and, and have fun. And then later in, in the early 80s, it comes that the HIV crisis came over, over the gay community and, and all the people were dying. Mm -hmm. And so the sisters start to paint their faces white. And uh, as a symbol of all the people deceased on this this uh, disease, yeah. Uh, and in, in the different um, countries, nearly all sisters have the white face. Mm. Uh, in Australia, there's a chapter not using the white face, but they have the wimples and, and, and the habits and something like this. But usually you, you recognize a sister by its white face. Mm. When you go out on a regular night, which do you prefer? It depends on uh, what I would like to do. If I would like to, to spread the word, uh, uh, to, to say, take care when you have a sexual active life and go to a testing on a regular basis, then I go out as a sister. Oh. But uh, when I just would like to have fun or, or have some drinks, I, I got as a private me, and, and this could be in rubber more, more often. Oh, I see. How do people react to you when you are a sister in public? Usually they smile. Um, they, they stop, they, they look a bit, and usually they smile. And this is my biggest intention. I would like to give a smile to everyone. Mm. Sometimes if it's getting later and people are maybe a bit drunk, it could be a bit difficult, but uh, as a sister, I never go out alone. And I always have uh, a guard or someone with me. And oh. uh, I have had the luck not to be involved in, in uh, violence or something like this. And here in Switzerland, I had never, never, ever a bad word. In uh, Germany, it happened, yes. Hmm. It was in Munich. Um, we were, have been out together in a, in a bunch of sisters and we came out, uh, home lately. And there was a drunk guy and he, he was up for some, well, let's say for, for some mess or some, I, I, I don't know what. Mm. But um, when we have this, we don't react to this. We try to avoid the situation and leave this guy alone. How long have the sisters been growing in Europe? In Europe, it's a, it's a long history, more than 25 or 30 years. Oh. We have uh, had the first house in, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 90s, I think it was in Heidelberg. Oh. And uh, then um, they, were, they were starting to, to move over to, to different cities. Most uh, active one houses are in Berlin and in Munich, and we have got in Cologne. Mm, mm. And we have got sisters in Paris, we have got sisters in Lyon, in Edinburgh, but I don't know when they actually started. Uh, how active is the scene in Berlin, for example, for the sisters? Oh, but uh, before the lockdown, it was very busy oh. because there's always something to do. Not always the fetish things, but, but a lot of uh, sisters are going to the fetish clubs. But uh, in Berlin, they're, they're nearly every, every second weekend on the tour ah. and, and try to spread condoms and uh, try to collect money. And yeah. How in Switzerland? Because if you are the only active sister, mm -hmm. What's going on in Switzerland with the sisters? <laughs> yes, in, in Switzerland, um, 
it's a bit, uh, yeah, what's going on here? It's going, this is going on what I do. <laughs> so um, I try to be present to towards the fetish scene, but to other scenes too. Um, it's not so so easy to, to find someone who would like to spend a lot of time, a lot of, um, yeah, educating himself into becoming a sister because it's not just to put on the white face put on some some uh, headpiece and then you are made a sister mm. it's it's a little journey to go there and um, the biggest part is to take yourself your personality back to to be there for the community and um it's it's uh, as all these orders maybe a Catholic uh, nun order or something, they all have uh, problems in finding someone who comes after them. Do you have plans to actively draw people into this system? I wouldn't say that I have active plans because um, here in Switzerland, I, um, I am here for as a sister for two years. This is not much for a sister to, to, to do their work. And so I, I take a little time and wait until maybe someone comes towards me and say, hey, what you're doing is great and I would like to join you. And not many people know that we have got guards too in our house. This is the male opposite of, of the sister appearance. So um, sometimes people think, oh my God, I would like to, to do some social commitment as a sister, but oh my God, this drag, why, why do I have to do this? So no, but in our house, it's possible to do this as a, in, in the male appearance too. How many people are, you, you mentioned in the house, how many people are active in that? In our house, in the Bavarian Abbey, it is about 13 fully professed members, if I count it right, and oh. one, um, one sister who's just starting. So this is what we call an, um, uh, how do we call this? Novice? Not, 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 not novice, it's postulant, it's um, oh. uh, something like a postulant sister. Oh, oh yes. Oh. So we have, uh, in our house, we have um, four things to, to, four steps to become a sister. The first is the aspirat. This is to, to just go with the sisters and see what they do without makeup, without a, uh, just as you are, as a private. And then you decide, okay, what they do could be interesting for me. Mm. Mm. And after this comes the postulate, like in a real monastery order, we get uh, our first veil. It's a short one and you look like, well, it's, it's difficult to describe, but you look a little bit like you're going out to milk the cows. Oh. It's, um, it's, it's not so nice. <laughs> but yes, it, it helps. <laughs> it helps to get you into being more visitor, visible in the scene because now you have got a little white face and, and a little veil. And then <laughs> this is the postulate. Not, not, not the nicest time. No, not, it's not right. It's, it has been a nice time too. <laughs> and How long after that. You? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, after that comes the novice, novice time. Then you get a white veil, a little bit longer and, and similar to this. And after this, when you think you are ready and uh, your community of, of nuns think you are ready too, you get the black veil. And the time is not set in stone for everyone. It takes how long you take for every step. Oh, I see. I see. I wondered about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's always about how much time you, you're able to, to spend together with the sisters so they can see how you are improving, how you, you learn the things you have to learn, how you learn about contents, how you behave towards the community. Because when we go out, we will get in touch with some very, very heavy themes and heavy discussions or maybe something which is very heartbreaking and we have to learn about this. How long was the process for you? I was a fast runner. <laughs> so I had three months of uh, no, 
six weeks of aspirate, then three months of postulate, three months of noviciate, and a half year. Altogether, it took me a year to become a sister. This is very fast, but I spent nearly every weekend together with the sisters because it meant very much to me. But a moment ago, you mentioned that during all of this learning process, that you had to deal with some very heavy topics. What did you mean? Sometimes um, we, we are the first people uh, who get known of um, a recently HIV diagnosis. Maybe if we go out and, and see someone sitting there, maybe being depressed, we go there, ask, hey, is everything fine? Um, and it could be that this guy maybe just received an HIV diagnosis or maybe something other um, different situation in his private life. And our, our appearance and our being is there to talk to them and to listen to them. And this what, could be tough, yes. What's the worst you've ever had to manage in that respect? Um, I, I talked to someone who recently lost a good friend because of an HIV di diagnosis, because this friend committed suicide. Oh. And uh, this reminds me to my own uh, way of becoming a sister. When I was younger in the, in the 90s, a good friend of mine committed suicide of this too, because he received this diagnosis. And to me, it was okay. We find a way, we, we, we go, go through this together. But um, yeah, this was very hard for me because mm. it, it was like a flashback, yeah. I'm very curious about the structure, the social structure that you depict in the house for the nuns. I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Would you please explain a little bit about how the order works in that situation? So to be to, uh, clear, every different house has its own rule and its own um, uh, way how they, they prepare, um, how they present that cells. In our abbey, we have got a mother abbess. We have got um, Prioressa. This is the second uh, sister of importance. We have got a tertia. She's always uh, busy with doing all the, the writing protocols if you have meetings. And then there's the rest. Okay. It sounds like, like very, very strict hierarchical levels, but um, it's easier if you present something to, to the outward. And, and if someone has to do to decisions for, for us or to tell decisions. It's easier if this is um, um, one of those uh, elected persons, but we are all allowed to talk to everything. I, I am very curious about the type of traveling you must do. Some of the places must find you very uh, shocking maybe do you visit places where it's difficult, like Poland, for example? Um, I would love to go there if it's possible, because actually we have got a sister in Poland who's doing a very, very hard job. And I would like to support her. And uh, she's a wonderful person. And what she's doing there is, is outrageous. I am here in Switzerland here. I've got a very lucky position because in Switzerland, being gay is, is not a problem. It's not uh, a topic. If I have the chance to go there, I will go there and support her. Yes, definitely. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you think it would happen after COVID? Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, we have uh, the connection about the Berlin house. And um, she has been made her, her sister education with the Berlin sisters. And I am... Uh, in very good contact with Sister Daphne from Berlin, and uh, we will try to organize this to go there and support Lovely. Her. But another question comes to my mind. In Europe, you have many different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, is the common language for you in English? Well, usually when I'm around in Germany, I, I tell everything in German, and when I'm in Austria, usually even if, it, if it's a special event, we do all this in German. Here in Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, I try to, to do this in uh, German and in French. 
but okay. yes there's always the, the the task to do it in english because we will visit international events like um, it has been in 2019 in austria where i was um together with the for the election of mr puppy austria 2019 and it was very international we had uh, so many guests from all over the world and mm. i had to do everything in english and it was a little bit uh, Yes. <laughs> you have you visited the sisters, for example, here in North America? Not yet, not yet. Uh, in I, I mentioned the Mr. Papi Austria election in 2019, and uh, there I was able to meet Pap Kona, Pap Sirius, and Pap Case, and uh, they had the idea to invite me to IPO in uh, Indianapolis, and mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, then came the, the COVID pandemic situation and we have to postpone it. But this was planned to, to move Sister Greta to, to America. And um, yeah, it was planned to meet the sisters there too, which would be very, very interesting for me because what we sisters do here in Europe is, I think, a bit more different from what the sisters in America do. And what is that? Um, I think in, in America, it's the, when the sisters go out, it's, it's different from what we do here because we are more in spreading condoms and, and uh, being, being around. And I think uh, in, in, in the sisters in America, they, they do a lot of uh, voluntary donations. They collect a lot of money. They, they run bingo. They, they, they gather so much good good things together to support the community because uh, there's a complete different health care system and a complete different social care system as we have mm. and i would like to learn from them i would like to go there and then see what's their what, what's their drive to go on and how do they do it you mentioned that it, it, the sisters in europe tend to for example promote condom use Mm -hmm. How do the people react to that? Different, and that's a good way to get into the discussion because not only condoms are very good to, to be protected from HIV. We have got the, the PrEP, yes. we have got uh, the, the undetectable equals uh, untransmittable commitment, which is in the world since 2008 and not many people know about it. And this is for us a good start to, to talk about HIV statuses or go to, to testing on a regular basis. We don't insist in using condoms. We say this is an option, but you have this option or that option too. And maybe you didn't heard of U equals U is a, a way of, of HIV treatment too. And, and uh, it, it works to protect yourself. If, and we are trying to, to get the people to a regular testing if they have a sexual active life. They should go know their status. They should check the HIV status, the other sexual transmittable, transmittable diseases. They just should check. Do you, do you feel people do that? Sometimes we can reach someone with this message and we say oh think about today it's testing day and it's over there go there <laughs> and then he said okay i should go and he goes um if only one person goes i think yes this is a good one. Oh, okay okay i'm finding nowadays fewer and fewer people are using condoms mm -hmm. because undetectable is untransmittable there's prep. What are your personal feelings on that? If it helps to, to release a sexual life inside whoever, then it's a good way because sexuality itself is good. And we have been taught very long time, oh, only use condoms and only this. And if you don't this, it's, it's dirty, it's not good. And, and we, we put so much guilt on other people. And um, I'm not the person who, who, who should judge about using condoms or doing whatever. I'm the person who would like to say, go to a button testing on a regular basis. The rest is your thing because it's your responsibility. You've mentioned the puppy community mm -hmm. and iPod. This is how we were introduced. Uh, of course, for the audience, I can tell the audience that 
the original plan was that I would do the interview at IPAW, but unfortunately COVID has made the world miserable. So we are doing it this way. What is your connection with the puppy community? I have very, very good friends in Vienna, Pap Dino and Handler Benji, and they were the one who brought me together with the puppy community. They gave me the possibility as a sister to host some of their events and to be together with them. And this is where my, my beginning, to me, the puppy community starts. At first it was like, oh, yeah what this <laughs> and the more I, I have been able to, to spend time together with these wonderful guys and girls and and wonderful beings no matter what what, what sex they have um, it was so welcoming it was so enriching my, my my life because it was so playful so respectful so so including and um, yeah this is how I came in touch with the puppy scene. And of course, here in Switzerland, we have uh, some great puppies too. Um, one is a very good friend of mine. And uh, yeah, he supports me always when I'm around with a, as a sister. And, and this is a very good feeling to have him by my side, yes. So it's a very good uh, uh, joining of communities, yes. Definitely, definitely. Okay. I always wondered what it, would be uh, or what drives them on to, to go to, to do puppy play and I'm still learning about it but it's uh, very fascinating it's still fascinating and um, it's so wonderful how, how they embarrass uh, embrace me not embarrass this is not right embrace it's when you do the arms wide open and take someone and uh, this is what happens to me in the in the puppy scene is the puppy scene growing a lot in Switzerland? In Switzerland, I would say it's constantly not growing like, like uh, this way, like, like uh, an exponential uh, growing. But but yes, it's constantly getting more and more yeah, you, uh, admirers of it because it's a very, very interesting way to start with fetish. Mm. I, I think it's not necessary to have a fetish, but uh, it's a good way to to test things, to to try out, and um, yeah. How about the puppy scene in the rest of Europe? How do you see it in other places? Oh, we have um, a very active puppy scene in France, and one of those puppies who became Mister Puppy France is happen to be a guard of uh, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence too. And uh, we are in a very loose connection, but uh, it's, it's nice to see him somewhere at, at some events or when he's going on with his uh, pack of, of other puppies and yeah. How are the puppy events, for example, in Munich or Berlin or other places? The, the events I have been to, they were very, very well organized. They were very, very structured. They were always the people around taking responsibility for everything. And then they say, I'm here for this question. I'm here to guide you there. I'm here to, to bring you to this place. Or I'm here to introduce you to that. And uh, to me, it was very organized, very, very very welcoming for, for newbies too. It was very playful and uh, it, it pulls people inside. Uh, uh. What do you hope you can achieve as a sister going forward? As a sister, I would like to achieve that everyone should feel welcome. Everyone should feeling sh should feel happy and uh, our first thing is to spread universal joy and this is what I like to be to, to do with all the people around me and the second is to experience stigmatic guilt because gay people are always told you are not right you're not good you're too 
to gay to to butch to to slim to to what don't know what and and this is the second thing i would try to to put out of the world this um way of thinking how everyone should be everyone is okay like he is and if he's bigger or a plus sized he is like it he and she is like it is and it's good it's it's wonderful you don't have to be something for someone else you have to be for yourself does being a sister require a big financial uh incentive <laughs> no not 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 necessarily um because it's not about how much money you can give it's about how much love you can give and um, of course you should be able to, to to buy yourself your makeup because we, we are um, just buying these things on our own money we don't uh, go there outside and say oh we need money to to buy our, our outfit or something like this but in our houses we help each other when we have a sister which has not so much money we say okay i've got uh, address which could fit you maybe it's something for you or you i can support you with with some makeup so this is not in our house and in other houses i think this is like this too it's not about how much money you have because much money doesn't make you a good person true, true. not always yeah. <laughs> sometimes sometimes but was there a reason you chose your particular abbey your particular house Yes, and uh, yes and no. When I was together with the sisters in Berlin, there have been the sisters from Berlin, from Munich and from Cologne. And I have uh, talked to all of them for a very long time there. And the decision to go to one of those houses was made more by accident because from Basel where I live or near Basel I live it's it's nearly the same time to go to Cologne or to Berlin or to, to Munich and so oh. I have had one of uh, a friend of mine who was in the Bavarian Abbey too and so I decided okay th then I go there it's easier for me. Uh, what do you feel is the biggest challenge for the fetish scene in Switzerland? To grow together because we have the leather scene, we have the rubber scene, we have the puppy scene, we have mm -hmm. not so much space in Switzerland that it's space for so many scenes. So my wish would be to, to come together, not, not put everything under the same hat, but uh, a peaceful coexistence would be very interesting. Uh, yes. Do you think it will be achieved? With time, I think, yes, it is possible. And uh, it has to be made sure that every every community stays every community, not that the leather scene would like to take over the rubber guys and the rubber guys are not taking over the puppies and the puppies are not going to be on top of everything. What are your plans after COVID? Oh, my plans after COVID are going to Frankfurt because I have got a very, very strong connection to the leather club in Frankfurt. And I would like to see the guys there to support the local HIV um, health care there. I would like to, to go to Berlin too because um, a very good sister of mine is living there Sister Wester, she was, uh, she is in our house, but uh, she has passed a very, very bad health condition. She suffered from from uh, cancer, and uh, I would like to go out with her, of course, as a sister, and just have fun. Mm. And I would like to to visit my friends in Austria, in Vienna, and of course, I would like to to visit some or to host some some Swiss events, which are going to hopefully happen and uh, maybe we will see what comes and when I will have the possibility but I definitely would go out and, and meet people because this is what I'm missing so much. Yes, yes. What is the biggest misconception about you? I, I cannot find words for this but um, <laughs> 
but I think it's uh, that, that that I think everything is fine and everything is good or could be good is, is a misconception. Yes, because it isn't. But I would like to to tell other people we we can do this together. Yes. Greta von Breitenbach, I thank you very much for participating in a wonderful interview. And I sincerely look forward to meeting you in person.